You mean to tell me that the baseball game I fell asleep on 20 years ago is only in the bottom of the third inning? Hey everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. This week I'd like to devote some time to a number of things. One is I'd like to just go back and just uh, refresh and just reinforce the greatness of J.R. Richard. You know, he passed away this month and I devoted a show to him, but kind of ran out of time. Uh, really trying to make or even reinforce the point I wanted to make that this guy was really on the up and up, that his career was really going to take off. And unfortunately, a blood clot led to the end of his career and uh, just tragedy. Uh, and another actually Astro with kind of a tragic flaw, the great Don Wilson, Larry Durker, J.R. Richard. And uh, Richard, my point was this, I was going through his stats, which I love to do. And I noticed this because I always try to look for a pattern, something I can, I can come up with and just run with. Well, I did. I ran with this one. His career ended in 1980, really the highlight. And ironically, I, I believe uh, one of the last games where uh, he takes them out is the All-Star game. He was the starter for the 1980 NL team. At that point, he was 10 and four. His ERA was an unbelievable 1.71. The previous year, he had won 18 games and he was in a run there. I think it was like 18, 20, 18, 18. And then he had the 10 wins in 1980. So he was off and running. He was putting together a nice hall of fame uh, resume there. And he, 1980, he probably would have won another 20 games second time in his career. And probably, I don't know whether he would have been touched in the second half because this is where my argument goes. His last 20 decisions from 1979 to 1980, he was 15-5. And, and of those 20 decisions, nine of them, 45% involved shutouts. And he was 8-1 and one in those games. In other words, he threw eight shutouts of those 15 wins. Eight of them were shutouts. He lost one game, one nothing. And he was on a roll. Not only did he have the shutouts, I think over those 20 games, I, I, I think I mentioned it in last week's episode, he gave up a total of 40 runs. His ERA was under 2 or 2.0 or runs per game 2.0. And his ERA, I think, was, let's say, 191. And then in 1980, at the All-Star break, it was like 171 or 172. So this guy was... Just really an unbelievable uh, pitcher, unbelievable talent. And I equate him. He wasn't he wasn't the same pitcher as Bob Gibson. He was much, much taller. Uh, I would say a little bit leaner, 6'8", 225. I kind of almost equate him because this is where I'm going with the show today. We're talking uh, about Howard had sent me an email about the no-hitter that was spun by, by Tyler Gilbert last night of the Arizona Diamondbacks. And it was funny because I was thinking about Johnny Vandermeer. We'll get to that in a second. But anyway, when I was doing the research on the no-hitters again, I noticed Randy Johnson, and I forgot, you know, he played for a ton of teams, and of course, one of them being the Astros. And he spun a perfect game for the Astros. And I think he's like one of four pitchers to do no-hitters, throw no-hitters in both leagues. I think another one was Nolan Ryan, Jim Bunning, uh, and I think uh, Nomo. Uh, with the L.A. Dodgers, who still has, I think, the only no-hitter in at, at Coors Field in Colorado. Anyway, I think that Jr. was more uh, and blessed with the same kind of talent as Randy Johnson. And you got to remember this: even though he didn't have a ton of wins, his winning percentage was over six hundred. So he was on his way. Uh, I was thinking this. He was about age 30 when uh, J.R. finally uh, uh, stopped pitching because of injury. I would say conservatively, let's say he wins 15 games over the next five, six years. That's 90 wins. 
and maybe he has a couple of 20 win seasons in there. So he, he approaches like another 100 wins over the next five, six years. So you're talking about a guy with not just 200 wins, but a winning percentage well over 600. Those are Hall of Fame numbers. And who knows what the Astros would have done in with him on the mound because you're talking about another five, six years. Now you're putting him with Mike Scott, that 1986 team, and J.R. Richard might have had a different story there. It would have been interesting. And 1980, I know that um, a couple of players from that 1980 team, remember they lost in five, uh, an incredible playoff to the – uh, Philadelphia Phillies, anybody who ever saw those games, they were nail biters and they didn't have JR. Things might have been different. Maybe the Phillies don't get their first World Series. Maybe Mike Schmidt isn't the MVP of the World Series. And who knows? History uh, is changed there. So JR Richard, unbelievable pitcher. I wanted to show you or, or just let you know or just reinforce the fact that he was on his way to dominating dominating the league. Incredible. Anyway, this led me to this. Howard sends me an email today and, and kudos to Howard for, for doing that because I was going to, <laughs> with my cartoon today, I was going to lash out about the lengths of baseball games, but you know what? Baseball is too, too blessed, too great a sport to really complain too much about the length of a game. Although you do feel like Rip Van Winkle every once in a while, you can fall asleep on the game think it's over and it's only in the fourth inning like the cartoon had indicated. But I, I tell you, it was amazing. I was thinking about records, and I guess this was uh, as a result of last week's show. And one record that is always brought up that will never be broken is Johnny Vandermeer. And I was going to devote a show or talk about him in a later episode when Howard sends me about Tyler Gilbert spinning the no-hitter in his first start in his Major League Baseball career. And he spins a no hitter. So then I went through, and of course I got my my uh, my baseball cards, and of course here's Jr. again with those Kellogg's uh, pictures and all the rest of it. I was looking up. Here's Tyler, and of course I'll talk about Bill McKechnie in a couple of minutes. He's a Hall of Fame manager, won four pennants and two World Championship, won uh, four pennants with three different teams, got him into the Hall of Fame. He works today because he was the manager for Johnny Vandermeer during Vandermeer's Cincinnati days. This fellow down here, of course, this is Johnny Vandermeer. Okay. This fellow down here, that's Bobo Holloman, who, like two other players at the turn of the century, and, of course, Tyler Gilbert, are the only guys who ever took the mound uh, in their first major league start and threw a no-hitter. Now, Bobo, like the other guys um, – Breitenstein and Bumpus Jones, Ted Breitenstein and Bumpus Jones were from uh, the turn of the century. Three of the four have career under 500 records. And even the guy that we're talking about today, Johnny Vandermeer, he's two games under 500. So throwing a no hitter, and I wish Gilbert all the best, uh, does not <laughs> guarantee that you're going to have a successful winning career as a major league pitcher. It seems quite the opposite. And for Bobo, here was the funny thing. His manager was Marty Marion. And he had thrown a couple of games in relief and got shelled and actually went to Marty Marion. You got to give Bobo some credit that he had the moxie to go up to Marty Marion, the manager of the Browns. Now remember the Browns were mired in just being a Terrible team, with the exception of 1944. But Holloman goes up to Marty Marion and he says, look, Skip, I think I'm a better starter than a reliever. Now, you got to remember, many times relievers in the olden days, prior to about 1968-69, those guys who went in relief, that means that they had bombed on the mound and there was no other place for them. They were basically put out the pasture and came into games that were either blowouts one way or the other, it seemed, because there wasn't the strategy involved with the relief pitcher and there wasn't the emphasis on the relief pitcher that there is today, which made the game better, longer, but better, but better, interrupted more, but better, strategically speaking. And which is why it's so difficult to hit the baseball today. 
Well, anyway, he throws the no-hitter, but that was his apex because after that, pff, he bottoms out as a starter as well as reliever. And even before the end of the year, I, he sold off to the Toronto Maple Leafs, which were a high-ranked minor league franchise. I think in the Western League or maybe even in the Canadian League, whatever. Bobo does get back to the major leagues, but his career is never, never the same. But Johnny Vandermeer, now, Howard gave me an idea. I was going to run with it anyway about Johnny Vandermeer. Of course, he's a Bergen County guy, Midland Park. He had 119 wins, 121, but he's known, of course, for the back-to-back uh, -back no hitters that he threw in 1938. And that's where I was um, going with this because, like all the other episodes, <laughs> I do some research. I do some research. And I do some research. As I was doing Johnny Vandermeer, I was thinking, let me just see where I'm going with this. And I was looking and, you know, usually you think that Johnny Vandermeer, he throws an O'Hare. And the funny thing is, I actually saw Johnny Vandermeer at an old timers game way back in the 70s at Shea Stadium. Of course, he played for the opposition, but uh, I actually think that was the old timers game that they tried to balloon Ralph Kiner in and the balloon crashed into the wall in center field. If you were at that game, just uh, email me because I think it was at the same game. Anyway, Johnny Vandermeer was there. I never realized he was from Bergen County. And, um, but he does have, and actually I also believe that Bill Wands gas was there too. And of course he's the only one who ever had an unassisted triple play in the world series. He did it in 1924, the Cleveland Indians. I'll tell you what, he didn't have a Hall of Fame career, but if that were <laughs> going to be on my <laughs> as uh, on my uh, the last words, or uh, you're going to etch those on my gravestone, not bad. I take it, not bad, because it shows I made the major leagues and I did something of significance in in the biggest stage, the World Series of all time. Anyway, I was looking at Johnny Vandermeer, and here's the irony of irony. This guy had a 15-10 and 10 record the year that he uh, spun the two no-hitters, and I'll, I'll go into those. He beat Boston, and he beat Brooklyn. He beat Brooklyn 6 to nothing, and I think he beat Boston 3 nothing. We're going to go to the box scores uh, when we get a chance on those. The funny thing is he was 15-10, and 10, 312 ERA. The two years that the Reds win the pennant, in the National League, led by Bill McKechnie, who was their Hall of Fame manager. He's 8-10, and 10, under 500. Now, I think he might have had arm problems. Why? Well, his first year in the Major Leagues, 1937, he's under 500. He's 3-5, three 3-8-4 ERA, through 80 innings. The next year, McKechnie basically triples his output, 225 innings. The following year, 1939, it's uh, they're almost halved. He only pitches 129 innings, and then in 1940-48. So I get the gut feeling. I would assume that he was hurt, maybe he had a sore arm, and as a result of it, only had 18 decisions between 1939 and 40. Now, why I say that's ironic because those are happened to be the years that the Reds win the pennant in the National League and then the World Series in 1940, beating the Tigers, I believe, in seven, losing the year before to the Yankees in four straight. They get swept by the Bronx Bombers in 1939. McKechnie, I was, and that's where I'm just going to run with this with McKechnie, okay? And that is that McKechnie is a Hall of Famer. He had already won a World Series with the Pirates in 1925. And then he goes to the Braves. Here's McKechnie. Now, this guy must have, must have been some manager. And, and, and here's why I say that. McKechnie wins with the Pirates 1925. He goes 95 and 58, 621 winning percentage. Remember, they're only playing 154 games at the time. He goes to St. Louis and wins the pennant in 1928. He's 95 and 59. In fact, I think he wins... 
Five times he wins 90 or more games, which is pretty incredible with 154 game schedule. You don't realize those eight games, what they can do uh, to your team's uh, win toll. It's a lot. It's another week of play when you think about it. Goes to St. Louis, uh, wins the pennant, but they lose 1928. I believe to the... uh, I want to say the Philadelphia A's that they lose to in 1928. Okay. Uh, he stays with St. Louis, 1939. He goes, he's over 500, but, and he's the third of three managers means that he managed, then doesn't manage, then comes back and manages at the tail end of the season. But then he's not rehired. He goes to the Braves and in his first year with the Braves, he wins 70 games. Now, doesn't seem like a lot, but the Braves had some terrible teams way back when. He goes down to 64 wins the next year. Then he gets the Braves up to 77 wins, 83 wins in 1933, 78 wins. He's over 500 again in 1934. And then everything bottomed out for him with the Braves. They only won 38 games and win at a 248 clip. They go 38 and 115 in 1935. But This has got to be the greatest turnaround in any North American sports history because he goes from 38 wins to 71. Now, I know there's going to be football fans out there. What about teams that go from one win or no wins and then they get eight? Okay, I get it. But this is 38 wins with the Boston Braves in 1935. And 1936, he's up to 71. And by 1937, he's basically doubled. The win total with 79 uh, wins by 1937. And then it's almost the Braves bit him a do. Latches on to the Reds. First year with the Reds, he wins 82 games. Then in 39 and 1940, he wins 97 and then 100 games. Kind of tails off a little bit with the Reds after that, after they win the World Series, because they only get 88 wins in 1941. In 1942, he's got him at 500, gets him back up. 1943, 20 games over 500, 89 wins by 1944. But remember, these are the war years. And then it bottomed out for McKechnie with 61 and 64, respectively, uh, wins. And in fact, he's fired during the 46th season as they come back from war. He um, never manages again. And this is what drives me crazy. I wish the Reds had just kept him a little bit longer because he winds up with 1,896 wins, 1,723 losses, 524 winning percentage. Now, you can argue maybe not the greatest winning percentage. He also didn't have the best um, teams to work with. It wasn't like he was going to the Yankees or Brooklyn in, in the 40s and 50s here. Uh but he does win four, uh, four pennants and two World Series in his 25 years of Major League Management service. One every six years, that's not too bad to do that, okay? Ask Gene Mark, who was close but never got to the World Series as a manager. So that's Bill McKechnie. Okay. Now this isn't an actual baseball card per se, not like uh, the ones I showed you, but this is kind of one of those replica ones that they do. And it's all for marketing and all the rest of it. That's Bill McKechnie. I did find some other pictures of him with the Boston Braves and all the rest of it, but let's get to Johnny Vandermeer. I was looking at his stats. Now he wins 15 games, 1938, 16 games in 1941 18 in 1942. As I was looking through this, to me, that was his best season in the major leagues. Forget the two no-hitters. Yes, remarkable. But for a resume, 18 and 12, 600 winning percentage, 2.43 ERA. Much, much better than his 312 that he had during his uh, no-hitter year of 1938. And here's the thing. Didn't realize this. And this is why I'm starting to think, you know, little Jacob the comparisons. I'm not saying they're the same, but bear, uh, just, just listen. He wins the strikeout title three straight years 
with 202, 186, and 174. Most pitchers today get 174 by, by June. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, there's going to be a major league pitcher who throws 500 strikeouts to lead the league one year, the way that it's going right now. Oh, there I am complaining about the longevity and the state of the game today with so many strikeouts. And um, in those three years, he got, he wins 16, 18, and 15. Now, he does go 15 and 16 in 1943, then the war. He comes back in 1946. He's 10 and 12, 9 and 14. And then his his really his last good year in the major leagues, he goes 17 and 14 with the Reds at age 33. Hangs on for one more year in 49 with the Reds. He goes 5 and 10. And then has two seasons where he goes to Chicago and Cleveland. And uh, he's three and five with those two uh, teams. So what I did was this. I threw those out. And as I was going through, because what I like to do is I love going through the list and see if there's a pattern. Was there a particular team that he uh, just owned? And like. Anybody who remembers almost a year ago, remember how I told you that Seaver seemed to own Steve Carlton and the Philadelphia Phillies for a while there when he was a Met pitcher. I think he won eight of the nine meetings that they had. Um, interesting thing is that um, Johnny Vandermeer faced both Spahn and Johnny Sane in the same season within like 10 days and uh, I believe lost both of them. Ready for this? He lost 3 nothing and one nothing to Spawn and Sane. And I think the year was, uh, I think it was 1942 or something like that. But interesting thing, I'll, I'll give you this as I'm, I'm rummaging through my papers because I really wanted to do this. And this is where I get with the Jacob de, de Grom. And what I was looking at was this. You throw two no-hitters. You indicate you can win. And win big in the major leagues. How do I know that? Well, you have 18 wins and a 600 winning percentage and 17 wins at age 33. So you have some talent, Johnny Vandermeer. And believe me, I'm not being prejudiced because he's a, a Bergen County guy and all the rest. And I'm just, I, I'm looking at this as a scout. So I'm saying to myself, hmm, everyone in baseball talks about Jacob the the Grom and the lack of offensive production that his teammates give him when he takes them out. And I was looking at almost similar things uh, with Johnny Vandermeer. And it is incredible that of his 119 wins, he had to win 83 of them by allowing three or fewer runs because in 40 of those uh, 83 wins, his own teammates only produced three runs. In other words, he won a ton of games, 3-2, 3-1, 3-0. In fact, I believe he, he wound up with, uh, 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 during his, his, his run here, I think he had 22 shutouts during that, uh, that run that he had. Um, from 1939, look at this. He had 6, 10, 13. He had 13 shutouts during that run. And in his 83 wins in his career with the, uh, the Reds, well, he had more than that. He had 13, 20. I think he had like 26. And I threw, I only took the meat. His, his four best years, and I think I might have included his 1939 and 40, just to give it a little bit more flavor. So I didn't want to overcompensate one way or the other. I just wanted to see what happened in any given year. So I took like his five most productive or his five, let's say, prime years in the major leagues. Anyway, it was amazing how few runs were scored for Johnny Vandermeer. That, in fact, the offense had the score – um, in 40 wins, the offense didn't score for the Reds more than three runs. And yet he was able to get 83 wins out of that. It's incredible. Okay? He didn't have 
Many games, I think I there's a handful of games. I think it's 12 total that the Cincinnati Reds generated seven plus runs for him. There was a time, ready for this, where he was uh, just really, he had like six walk-off games. And I think he won five of them. It was incredible. And um, it, it just goes to show you that it's almost like a pattern follows. Put it this way. The Reds scored in his wins. He got 40 wins when the Reds scored three or fewer runs. When the Reds scored between four and six runs, he got 30 wins. And when they scored seven plus runs, the Reds scored, uh, Vandermeer got 17 wins. Now, let's put this in context. Compare him maybe to Gibson, compare him to DeGrand, compare him to Seaver, compare him to Whitey Ford. I'd have to do maybe a study on that. But what I was trying to show is, you know, Vandermeer was a pretty good pitcher. And I could actually argue this. He didn't get the run production that was owed him. Put it this way. I'll make it simple. From the years 1943, excuse me, 1948 when he goes 17 and 14, 1943 when he goes 15 and 16, 1942 when he goes 18 and 12, 1941, 16 and 13, and I did include 40 and 39 because they were pennant winning seasons and I wanted to see what the Reds did for him when he, even though he goes 8 and 10 in those, and then I included at age 23 when he goes 15 and 10. Ready for this? He's 89 and 73 in those games. 16 games over 500. Ready for this? The Reds scored 488 runs for him. He allowed 497. 2.94 runs per game. So then I threw out this. I threw out uh, just to make it better, I do believe, I threw out the eight games, the eight and eight year that he had in 49 and 39 and 40, just to give you a better measure. He goes 81 and 65, 16 games over 500, okay? The Reds scored 438 runs for him. The Reds, so the Reds scored three runs per game for him. And he allowed 2.94. He's outgunned uh, 378 to 384 if you include 1939 and 1940. And in those games, it's 2.89 to 2.93. So the Reds scored 2.89 runs per game. He allowed 2.93. I threw out the two years that, you know, he really wasn't, quote unquote, a part of the staff. And it figures out that the Reds scored three runs and he allowed 2.94, as the Reds scored only nine more runs than uh, he allowed. And yet he was 16 games over 500. Kind of a little like a Jacob de Grom, okay? So, well, what we're seeing is this. Maybe de Grom, obviously a superior pitcher, obviously, but can you imagine if the Reds, in those seasons, now look at this, 1939, the Reds scored 4.9 runs per game. All right? They were allowing 3.8. Vandermeer was really allowing less than that. Uh, 1940, the Reds were scoring 4.6. They were allowing 3.4. I'm going to go back to 1938. All right, one of his great years. The Reds were averaging 4.8 runs per game. The average here, the Reds were only giving him three. Can you imagine, if even if you split it in between, I would say that he probably would have won another 10%, maybe even 15. So that 119 wins on his career ledger, maybe he has another 20 wins and take 20 wins off. Now he's 140 and 100. 14 and 10 each year, theoretically. Not bad. The Reds again in 1937. 
All right. His first year, they were averaging 3.9, 4.6. He was just coming up Oop, next season. I'm just doing this as, as we speak. I do want to do the 1938 before I, I, I let you go, but these reds, all right, average 4.8 in the year. I'm, I'm just looking at it right now. They scored a total of 77 runs for him in 1938. So in those 25 decisions, they were scoring three runs a game. And yet the Reds averaged in 1938, they averaged 4.6, I think, right? Didn't I say that? The Reds averaged 4.8 runs a game. In his games, they're averaging just above three. In their runs against, averaging 4.2. In that year that he threw the no-hitter, 15, 95 divided by 15, he's averaging about what? Or excuse me, 25. The Reds were averaging under four runs a game in his 1938 season. He was averaging just a little bit above three. And what I'm saying is this. Had the Reds scored 4.8 in his 25 uh in his 25 decisions, they would have had 116 runs. They only gave him 95. And the same thing, 25 times 4, 100. So he kept them under by 20, 23 runs. Vandermeer was doing his job. The Reds just couldn't score for him. And there were many years, uh, actually, I was looking at this. There weren't too many um, decisions on Vandermeer's ledger where he was just totally destroyed. I think there was only about four or five games in his entire career where he let up more than nine runs a game. Just a couple. But he actually went a while there. He never had a huge winning streak until his final final good season with the Reds. He actually won six of his last seven decisions with the Reds uh, when he won 17 games in 1948. Uh so it, it, he's an interesting guy to study because, you know, we, we talk about run production and <laughs> there's certain guys that you actually say are just cursed when they go on the mound. And that is that, you know, players or the team just maybe they try too hard for the guy. I, 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 I don't know. Um, but, it, but it is interesting nonetheless to look at him and say, wow, like what was going on? I wish I could. Um, I just want to show you this. These are older ones. He actually won in 1948. He actually had, ready for this, these were the scores of his last one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, his last nine decisions. He won a game 5 2. So that brings his record up to 10 and 12. He wins 2 0. He loses 3 2. He wins 3 1. He wins 3 1. He wins 3 2. He wins 5-3. They finally have a big barrage of runs there. Beats the Giants. He wins 4-3. He loses 6-2. And on the last day of the season, in a walk-off win against the Pirates at home, he wins the game 1-0. So in those last nine decisions, they scored a total of 9, 12, 15, 18, 23, 30 runs, just a little bit above three. And he allowed 2, 5, 6, 7, 10, 12, 15, 21, 21. Just a little bit above two. All right, that's Johnny Vandermeer. That's probably him at his best. He did have one stretch in his career, and this was 1947, where he lost 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8 of 9 decisions. Ready for this? In those losses... He lost 3 0, 4 0, 4 1. All right, he gets banged around a little bit, loses 9 6 and 6 1. Then wins to break that losing streak, 5 0. Needs a shutout to do it. Then loses 4 2, 6 3, 4 3, and then um, wins two of his last three decisions, 8 1, loses 8 5. And then, wow, lo and behold, on the la one of the last games of the year, or one of his last decisions of the year, the Reds score 13 runs, and he eases to a win, 13 to 2. Pardon me. Then he wins two of his last three. He wins 3-2. The only game that I found during his Reds thing, he wins the game 12-10. 
And then he loses his final decision of that year, 1947. Uh, he loses seven to two. But that was the only win. I mean, you, you can see that he's not a – actually, he's a really good pitcher. I, I'm even thinking this, that had he gotten some run support – can you hear this, Jacob DeGrom? That, like I said, he probably has 10 to 15 uh, percent uh, more wins, probably about another 20 wins, and take those 20 wins away from uh, the loss side, and you're talking about a 40-game differential. And now you're talking about a guy who's maybe 140 and 100 in his career instead of 119 and 121. I just want to get to this a little bit before I get to the box scores of 1938. In 1941, now, there was one year where he had a ton of walk-off games that were decided. It was incredible. Again, the year he goes, ah, the year he's 15 and 16. Ready for this? He has one, two, three, four, five, six. He's involved in six walk-off wins. He wins. One and one, two and one, two and two, two and three, three and three. He goes three and three. Ready for this? Walk off win. I think it was even opening day or his first start of the year. He beats the Cardinals one nothing. In his other walk off win against the Giants, he lost six five, pitched all ten innings. Well, maybe nine and two thirds or nine and a third. Again, the Giants. Another walk-off. This one he wins. He throws 13 innings to win the game and wins 3-2. Makes his record 8-10. and 10. Against Boston, 12 innings he pitches and loses 3-2 in a walk-off. Not 12, technically. Maybe 11 and a third, 11 and two-thirds. I know. Loses back-to-back walk-off games. Loses to Boston 3-2 then loses to St. Louis 5-4. Loses to Pittsburgh 2-1. Beats Boston 1-0. Just incredible. Uh, uh, he lost another walk-off game 2-1 in 1946, I believe. Okay? It, just incredible. A year... Um, Lost another game in 10, no, won another game 4-3 in 10 innings over the Chicago Cubs. And he won both on the road and at home. I didn't tabulate the wins on that just because, um, just for time constraints. But I did want to get to 1938 and talk a little bit about those two um, incredible back-to-back no-hitters. Johnny Vandermeer was a better pitcher, and I know people might laugh, and you are what your record is and all the rest of it, but he was a good pitcher. Maybe should have had a little bit more luck, uh, and, and as I, I can show you here, he had some amazing games that he lost. Maybe you could say, well, you know, it bounces out with the games that he wins. All right, so they beat the Boston Braves. Ready for this? The game, ready? Just, just. Some of the guys, the big guy who won the game for them as they won 3 nothing. The Reds only got six hits. The losing pitcher for the Braves, that, or actually they were called the Boston Bees then, was Danny McFadden, who at that point was 5-2. and two. Vandermeer was 6-2. and two. Ready for this, Vandermeer, who would later go on to lead the league in strikeouts, he only had four in that game. He did walk three, so they were the only three guys to reach base. He had three walks. For the Reds, probably their big bopper in the game was Ernie Lombardi, his catcher. He was one for four. He had a home run, two RBIs, and, of course, Ernie Lombardi. When you think of Ernie, yes, he hit into a double play in the game. But there are actually two triples, one by Lou Riggs, a third baseman, and Wally Berger, who was a pretty good player. I think Berger actually played for the Braves as well for Boston. And in this game, ready for this, Johnny Vandermeer, nine innings, no hits, four strikeouts, three walks. His ERA at that point was 2.47. Remember, it ends at 3.12 for that year. Ready for this, the home plate umpire, George 
Major Kurth. Tiny Parker was at first. There was no second base umpire. And Charlie Moran was at third. Number of people in attendance, 5,814. Time of the game, one hour and 45 minutes. June the 15th, 1938. Oop. The Reds are... Uh, defeat the Brooklyn Dodgers in Brooklyn. I think also on that night, it was also the first night game played in Ebbets Field. So obviously that might have had something to do with it as well. Um, maybe, you know, the lights weren't in the right spot or maybe the lights were just blinding, but it didn't seem to affect the Cincinnati Reds. Regardless, here's the box score for that game. Ready for this? Six runs for the Reds, 11 hits. Interestingly enough, like the Boston Braves or the Boston Bees, the Brooklyn Dodgers committed errors in this game. Again, ready for this? The big players, Lonnie Frey at second was one for five. Wally Berger was three for five. He had a triple and a double. The home run in this game was by Frank McCormick. He was one for five with three RBIs. And for uh, these were the Dodgers, they struck out seven times. The only thing is, he gave up eight walks in this game. Eight walks. So Vander Meer's line, nine innings pitch, no hits, no runs. Eight walks, seven strikeouts. His ERA, 2.23. Time of the game, two hours and 23 minutes, 38,748. Home plate umpire, Bill Stewart. Dolly Stark was at first, no second base ump. And George Barr was the third base umpire. Johnny Vandermeer, owner of two consecutive no-hitters. This is Willow Tool. Shout out to Howard for the idea. Everyone have a great week, and thank you for allowing me to come into your homes and talk nothing but sports. See you next week with another episode.